जगदीश वारगड़े प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ शाकुर कोड बार एसोसिएशन ऑल टू टू दिस लीगल लेक्चर सीरीज पार्ट थ्री लेक्चर फोर टूडे वी हैव और गेस्ट स्पीकर एडवोकेट मृणालिंग देशमुख शी विल एड्रेस अस ऑन अ वेरी कोर इशू डे टू डे लाइफ इन योर डे टू डे प्रैक्टिस सो आई वुड लाइक टू रिक्वेस्ट एडवोकेट अरुण डोंगरे द वाइस प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ शाहपुर कोड बार एसोसिएशन टू इंट्रोड्यूस अवर गेस टू द स्पीकर ऑन दिस जूम एप एज वेल एज फेसबुक लाइव एडवोकेट डोंगरे प्लीज इंट्रोड्यूस एडवोकेट मोडल एंड देशमुख मैडम डोंगरे सर ठीक है दरवाजे उगड़ गए मार्क सर पार्टिसिपेंट्स ने विनंती है तुम्हें लेक्चर चा मधे कोनी स्वतावन अनम्यूट करूँ ना है या मुझे इतर लोकना लेक्चर आयकने मधे आर्चनी निर्माण होती है अपने ही लेक्चर जो आए थे ज़ूम बरोबरत फेसबुक वर्ती के प्रक्षेप आए www.facebook.com/shapurlawyers या लिंक पर क्लिक किया तो माला फेसबुक पर ये लेक्चर जो आए थे थेट प्रक्षेप वे यूट्यूब चैनल आए हैं या चैनल और अपने वाला या आदि जाने ले सर वो जो लेक्चर्स आए ये लेक्चर्स पाता है तीन तसे अत्ता से जो लेक्चर आए तेजी रिकॉर्ड है क्लिप सुधा लेक्चर जाने नंतर लगे से अपलोड के लिए जाते क्या मुझे जानसा यहाँ लेक्चर से दरमियात कोटे डिस्कनेक्ट जाला कि � लेक्चर में डिस्टर्बेंस ये होना है या साथी आपले जो ऑडियो और वीडियो जो आम चकरों म्यूट के लिए जाता है इस स्वतः उनको नहीं अनम्यूट करूं ना है अने आपला लेक्चर स्मूथली साला हुआ या साथी आपले ना सरकार या करवाशी विनंती है माजी और वो के डारून डोंगरे सर डोंगरे सर
करा जरा कनेक्शन मध्य अड़चण है एडवोकेट डोंगर सो आई इंट्रोड्यूस एडवोकेट मृणाली देशमुख टू ऑल आवर पार्टिसिपेंट्स एडवोकेट मृणाली देशमुख टोपे शी इज अ लॉ ग्रेजुएट फ्रॉम सेंट जेवियर्स कॉलेज ऑल्सो होल्ड्स अ एल एल एम डिग्री फ्रॉम यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ मुंबई इन कमर्शियल लॉ एज वेल एज मैट्रीमोनियल लॉ she has been pro professor of constitutional law at the kisi college of mumbai and has taught post graduate uh, graduate students as a visiting faculty at department of law university of mumbai her father tk tope was vice chancellor chancellor of mumbai university she has been invited to judge various prestigious moot court programs owing to her expertise in her field of practice she has also addressed and contributed in writing towards issues of sexual harassment at workplace also regarding issues of safety of women and children she has been invited as an expert by several mnc on committees to deal with sexual harassment cases at workplace mrs deshmukh often participates and addresses domestic and international conferences on issues relating to family law and structuring of wealth and alimony issues especially the laws governing the women mrs deshmukh strongly believes in gender justice and is extremely sensitive about injustice and malpractices while actively pro propagating gender equality she recently addressed an international conference on wealth planning for global indian families in dubai uae she has authored a book on divorce breaking up your step by step guide to getting divorce the book was published by penguin publications this book has an overview of the various laws with reference to marriage divorce child custody alimony etc which is a subject of today's lecture with illustration of cases personally handed over by her she has to her credit several conferences and events where she has addressed national and international audiences on various subjects of her expertise she addressed the columbia university usa students at south asian millennials conference on sexual and domestic violence in south asia in february 2016 and in june 2016 addressed the international lawyers in jurists from countries like usa uk and australia and other south asian countries on ethics and values of legal practice so we have the renowned lawyer in this field as our guest lecturer today i request munalini deshmukh madam to address the lecture thank you ma'am please please unmute yourself can you hear me now hello can you hear me yeah yeah ma'am okay namaskar at the outset uh, i am deeply honored and i am happy and privileged to be addressing this webinar which is organized on behalf on behalf of the shahpur bar association uh, i have watched your facebook and other things and i think the bar association is doing a great job in the field of imparting knowledge uh, uh, from the various professionals and experts in their own field especially during the period of lockdown so the lockdown period is not a period which is a complete washout which it could be jara apan marathi madhe manto tasa ki the sampurna lockdown asyamule apan kahich kelele nahiye practice keleli nahiye court at gelelo nahi ahe asa kahi hi na vatta apan ha jo vel ahe lockdown ta to aplyala aplyala jnana madhe bhar padavi vegvegya lokanche je experiences ahe kiwa tancha je professional expertise ahe tyacha basis var aplyala एक एडवांटेज मिलावा कि जी हा असोसिशन मगे कि वेबिनार मगे जी एक प्रिंसिपल है मी अतिशय कौतुक करते कारण कसा परिस्थिति मात कर उपयोग कराया कि एडवांटेज घयावा वेबिनार इज वन ऑफ सच थिंग विच इज देर सो थैंक यू वेरी मच आई एम रिअली ग्रेटफुल टू फॉर हैविंग इन्वाइटेड मी ओवर देर माझा जसा परिचय तुम्हाला करून दिला त्याच्यावर तुमच्या लक्षात आलं असेल की इट इज मोर दॅट माय माय फील्ड ऑर माय स्कोप ऑफ वर्क इज बेसिकली सिव्हिल लॉ 
आणि त्याच्यामध्ये मुख्य करून मॅट्रिमोनियल लॉ न वेन वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट मी आता मला जे सांगण्यात आलं तेव्हा मी की नुसतं इंग्लिश इंग्लिशमध्ये न बोलता थोडस इंग्लिश मराठी असं जर ज्याला म्हणतात ते कॉम्बिनेशन करून गेलं तर बऱ्याचशा लोकांना त्याचा उपयोग होईल परंतु आय एम व्हेरी हॅपी टू स्पीक इन इंग्लिश ऑल्सो व्हॉट एव्हर इज दर ऑफ डिमांड फॉर दॅट सो लेट मी नाव स्टार्ट विथ माय सब्जेक्ट विच हॅज बीन गिव्हन टू मी न दिस सब्जेक्ट विच हॅज बीन गिव्हन टू मी डील बेसिकली विथ द हिंदू मॅरेज ऑक्ट अँड इट ऑल्सो डील्स विथ द सब्जेक्ट ऑफ द व्हेरियस नुआन्सेस ऑफ दी ऍक्ट व्हेरियस ऍस्पेक्ट ऑफ दी ऍक्ट मॅरेज डिवोर्स and after divorce there are ancillary relief happen on the which is called in the in terms of the custody of the children if there are children born from the marriage or if there are no children born then what are the rights of the spouse as far as alimony maintenance is concerned and what are the rights of the spouse in case there are any joint properties or other matrimonial property the har us agar scope ahe to apan ya 45 minute madhe 50 minute madhe mi cover karne cha prayatna kare आणखी नंतर आपण हा सेशन क्वेश्चन आन्सर ला ठेवूया म्हणजे मग ते जास्त इंटरॅक्टिव्ह होईल आणि चांगल्या अर्थाने होईल सो टू अंडरस्टँड द हिंदू मॅरेज ऍक्ट विच वॉज इनॅक्टेड इन नाईन्टीन फिफ्टी फाय सो दिस वॉज अ लेजिस्लेशन विच इज पोस्ट इंडिपेंडेंट आणि विच इज आफ्टर द कॉन्स्टिट्युशन केम इन टू एक्झिस्टन्स इन अराउंड नाईन्टीन फिफ्टी प्रायर टू दॅट देर वॉज द अनकोडिफाईड पार्ट ऑफ द हिंदू लॉ आय एम नॉट गोईंग टू गेट इन टू द डिटेल्स ऑफ दॅट i'm sure all of you know about it daya bhaga mitakshara etc and that uncodified uh, hindu law was what was governing the hindus as far as their rights about marriage about their custody about their maintenance protection etc was concerned but the hindu marriage act is obviously based on the uncodified hindu law which was there that uncodified hindu law has been codified in 1955 to make it as a hindu marriage act as a result of which some of the provisions or some of the um, aspects of the un- uh, uncodified law have been incorporated in the hindu law which is there hindu law also has a rare distinction of having the basis of the matrimonial clauses act of 1857 of uk based on which the hindu marriage act has been drafted because that was a kind of a as i would call it a template or a, a role model on which the laws have been passed <clears throat> so what is the hindu marriage act so hindu marriage as we are, sorry what is a hindu marriage hindu marriage as we understand under the act now is both a sacrament means there are religious ceremony and is and is also a contract now why am i saying that it is a sacrament and also a contract because i will then i have to compare that with a special marriage act which is basically a contract because which is what is known as the court marriage or where you go and register yourself you want to get married there are certain procedures to be followed after 30 days notification etc <clears throat> your marriage is registered under the special marriage but under the hindu marriage act one of the essential conditions is for the sacrament part of it is that the essential ceremonies of marriage which is in there in section 7 of the act and why do i call it a contract i call it a contract because they have also given certain valid conditions for a hindu marriage and two conditions of a valid contract are incorporated in the Uh, in the marriage act one is the age of the party so as you see the age of the parties under the hindu marriage act the girl has to be minimum 15 and the boy minimum 21 years of age to be able to constitute a valid hindu marriage and secondly is also the mental ability or the lack of the mental ability which decides the validity of the marriage which decides also the validity of a contract if you see the contract act so the hindu marriage act is both a combination of uh, sacrament and the contract So having understood the basis of the Hindu marriage act let us first try and understand what are the types of marriages which are there. so as we know there is a valid marriage a valid marriage is all marriage which which uh, which I'll come to the section a little later then there is what is known as a void marriage which is void ab initio and there is third option, uh, option which is known as a voidable marriage so a valid marriage is that marriage which takes into consideration certain essential conditions but prior to that let us understand and i'll tell you why this is important for us to understand because lately there have been a lot of cases where these issues have come up hindu law it is where any two hindus who get the law is applicable to any two hindus who get married under the law so that is why one of the essential conditions is that the parties to the marriage have to be hindu 
The second essential condition is, which has been mentioned in section five of the act. Now, those of you who have the act, you will understand that this contains certain sections and those sections are basically to say that the age of the party, number two is about the mental capacity of the understanding of the party, the age, uh, the, uh, that they should not be within the prohibited degrees of relationship, they should not be suspenders of each other, which is a part of the prohibited relationship. And most importantly is that it has to be a monogamous marriage. So there cannot be any spouse living separated or otherwise at the time of the marriage. Now this has to be understood as one of the basic changes because I'm sure most of you know or most of, most of, most of them have been in their family or their friends where there have been uh, one man having two wives and they were living all happily together. There was no question of bigamy, there was no question of any of these things at all. But one of the provisions or one of the incorporated aspects of the Hindu Marriage Act is that there they have been very clear that it will be a monogamous marriage, one man, one woman. If you are a married person, you cannot get remarried unless you are divorced or you lose your, I mean, you, the wife is, dies and you lose your wife. So these are the essential conditions which are there. They are basically found in section 5 and, uh, and section uh, uh, 2 and section 11. Now, section 11, if there is a contravention of the section 11, that results in the marriage being void ab initio. And section 12 deals with certain aspects of the marriage where it is voidable at the option of the other. Now, what do you mean void ab initio? For example, if I'm a man and I'm married to a woman, and if I do get married to a second person, that second marriage is a void marriage because this law recognizes that it has to be within the, uh, it has to be one man, one woman. This is one example which has given you. So it, void ab initio means it is void at the beginning itself, at the instant, at the, uh, at the initial stages itself. The second question that comes up is what are the voidable marriages? I'm going to give an example. And voidable marriages, in, uh, as, as you will understand, is for example, a marriage is also one of the essential conditions of the marriage is the consummation of marriage or a healthy sexual relationship between the husband and the wife. That is one of the conditions of the marriage. Now, if one of the parties to the marriage is unable to consummate the marriage due to the impotency or the lack of ability on the part of the man or the woman as it can be, then the person who is the aggrieved party has a right to go to a court of law. Let me give an example. A couple is married and after marriage, the wife realizes that the husband is not able to consummate the marriage because he is important. Now, important as understood under the Hindu Marriage Act is not only a physical inability in terms of impotency, which a surgeon or a doctor will certify and say that he has a problem, but it could also be what is known as a mental or a relative impotency. Now, this is one aspect that all of you, especially young lawyers who are into this profession and some law students who may be here, need to understand that what is meant by relative impotency is impotency with qua the respondent in this manner, uh, qua the uh, petitioner in this manner. For example, a person, if examined by a doctor, would be considered to be absolutely normal to, to be able to perform all the sexual, um, uh, sort of, uh, the, the sexual relationship with his wife. But Despite that, he is unable to do so. And the reason why he is unable to do so, because there is a mental block in his mind, or there is some kind of a fear in his mind, or there is some kind of an anxiety in his mind with regards to that particular person. If that person is left with another woman, probably he may be able to consummate the marriage. So this is known as relative impotency qua the other spouse. So these are the two aspects. So if one of the persons is aggrieved, because in the example which I gave you, the wife is aggrieved that the husband is important because he is important uh, uh, physi physiologically or because he is important in this manner which is there. She has a right to declare, to go to the court, prove to the court and get her marriage voidable. What happens if she decides not to do anything? She has an option. She decides not to do anything. That marriage can continue. But that option is given to her. Similarly, what happens? And these are most of the cases which come to us also. What is known as a matrimonial fraud in such cases. For example, if you see uh, um, uh, in, in most of the times, and, and you'll be surprised to know it is not only 
in case of arranged marriages, but it is also in case of love marriages where parties have known to each other and there has been a fraud play on them. Now, what is the fraud as understood under the Hindu marriage act? More importantly, under section 12. A fraud as understood under the Hindu marriage act is that false representation or misrepresentation of a fact which otherwise if it had been revealed prior to marriage the consent of the other person would not have been there it's not very complicated i'll explain it lagna cha agodar jok tumcha madhe ji kami ahe hi goshta jo tumhi jo tya mulala sangitli asti samja ekada ekada goshti madhe mulila ekada psychological problem ahe मुलाला काही माहिती नाही ती तो भेटतो दोन जा चार जा त्याचे भेट होते ही फाईन द व्हेरी नॉर्मल परंतु तिला सायकोलॉजिकल प्रॉब्लेम्स आहे मेंटल हेल्थ इश्यूज आहे आणि ही गोष्ट त्याला सांगणं हे अतिशय गरजेचं असतं पण समजा मी या एखाद्या ठिकाणी जर त्यांनी एखाद्या मुलीनी किंवा मुलीच्या आई वडिलांनी ते त्यांना सांगितलं नाही आणि हे त्यांना माहिती नसल्यामुळे त्यांनी त्या मुलीला होकार दिला आणि लग्न झाल्यावर त्याच्या लक्षात आलं एक महिन्यात दोन महिन्यात किंवा कधीही की ह्या मुलीला मेंटल प्रॉब्लेम आहे आणि ही गोष्ट त्यांनी तिच्यापासून त्याच्यापासून आणि त्याच्या फॅमिली पासून लपवली आहे बिकॉज हिज कन्सेंट वुड हॅव अदरवाईज बीन नेगेटिव्ह कारण त्यांनी सांगू शकलं असतं की दिस इज दिस इज वॉट द होल इश्यू इज ना कमिंग बॅक टू दिस प्रॉब्लेम कमिंग बॅक टू दिस पर्टिक्युलर केस अगेन वॉट आय वॉन्ट टू ब्रिंग टू द नोटिस ऑफ दिस ऑफ ऑल द लॉयर्स युअर इज की तुम्ही जेव्हा ही गोष्ट लपवता तेव्हा तुम्ही त्याच्यावर मॅट्रिमोनियल फ्रॉड असा जर तुमच्यावर मॅट्रिमोनियल फ्रॉड झाला असेल तर यू हॅव अ राईट टू गो टू द कोर्ट अँड आस्क टू डिक्लेअर युअर मॅरेज पॉसिबल ऑन द ग्राउंड ऑफ सेक्स आणि तिसरं आणि मोस्ट इम्पॉर्टंट आहे की एखादी जर एखाद्या माणसाच्या जर लग्न ठरलं असेल एखाद्या बाई बरोबर आणि ती जर बाई लग्नाच्या अगोदर दुसऱ्या एका माणसापासून जर प्रेग्नेंट असते तिचं एक रिलेशनशिप होतं आणि त्याच्यामधून ती प्रेग्नेंट होती आणि लग्न जेव्हा झालं तेव्हा तिच्या पोटामध्ये त्या माणसाचं मूर्त अशा परिस्थितीमध्ये आणि ही गोष्ट जर त्या नवऱ्याला लग्नाच्या अंतर कळली आणि अगोदर माहिती नसेल तर तो पण एक ग्राउंड घेऊ शकतो पॉझिटिव्ह अनायकन आता ह्या सगळ्या गोष्टी आपण आता समजून घेतलेल्या आहेत वॉइड व्हॉइडेबल वॅलिड मॅरेज या सगळ्या गोष्टी आता आपण बघूया की अशा ज्या गोष्टी असेल तर ह्या कायद्यामध्ये वॉट आर द प्रोव्हिजन दॅट आर देअर अंडर द हिंदू मॅरेज ऍक्ट to deal with the various issues regarding the marriage section 9 of the hindu marriage act aplya sagyalas maiti ahe restitution of conjugal rights restitution of conjugal rights mhanje kay jar navra baiko ekatra rahat asel ani ekadi jab samjha ek example madhe if the wife has left uh, can the talk be in english uh, is a question that has been asked i am i am happy to do that uh, is everybody okay with that Yes, 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 ma'am. So may I continue in English? Yes, 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 ma'am. Okay, thank you. So as far as as far as um, restitution of conjugal rights is concerned, what does it mean? It means that if there is a couple which is a husband and a wife, and the wife has left the matrimonial home or the married home wherever they were staying, and she has gone away and staying with her parents, etc., without a reasonable cause or a sufficient cause, then the husband in this case, who is the aggrieved party. can go to the court and say she is my duly uh, she is my legally married wife she has left me and she's gone and she's staying elsewhere there is no sufficient cause for that you court please direct her to come back and resume cohabitation with me and reinstate my uh, reinstate my rights as a as a husband in this particular case the restitution of conjugal rights is a concept which arises from the fact that the marriage entails that the parties have to live together and the institution of marriage has to be now in this case the wife can come to the court and she say if one of you has a lawyer for the wife she can come and say that i am not somebody who has left the house unnecessarily he was not treating me well he was beating me not giving me food uh, humiliating me he was insulting me he was spying me he was constantly questioning me and doubting me i cannot live with such a man which is there so i am going i had i had no other option but to leave she may leave the house and just sit there and she may not even file for divorce but she just be away from it if the courts are satisfied that she has left without a reasonable cause which is not justified in the court of law 
they may ask the, uh, the wife to reinstate and resume cohabitation with the husband. But if the court feels that the husband has, has acted in a manner as a result of which he had no option but to leave the house and go, then they may reject the petition of restitution of conjugal rights. So this is what is meant in simple words, what is restitution of conjugal rights. Very often I have, I have uh, junior lawyers who come to me and say that, or some clients who come with little half-baked knowledge from the internet, etc., that um, my, my wife has left the house and she has gone. Um, she may ask for alimony, she may ask for maintenance. Is it not a good idea if I file for restitution of conjugal rights and I say, oh, let her come back and stay with me. Why should I pay maintenance for her? So this is an advice which most junior lawyers give their, uh, with their parties. And please understand one thing, and this is what I want to bring about in this case, that by making such advice, it does not stop the wife from making her life, uh, her claims of alimony, interim and any other form of support for her, financial support for her, even if the husband files for restitution of conjugal rights. I deal with it when I come in the maintenance part of it, but please remember that even if a husband files for restitution of conjugal rights, Till the petition is decided and the court to decide whether the wife should go back to the husband or she is justified, the husband will, in, and in the event the wife is unable to maintain herself and she makes an application for maintenance, the courts can direct such a husband to pay maintenance to the wife even during the hearing of the petition or restitution of conjugal rights. <clears throat> Thereafter, section 10 talks about judicial separation. I'll come to that a little later. The, 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 next, the next important point is section 13. Now, section 13 is, it talks about divorce. Now, please, to understand divorce, please understand what are the types of divorce. Initially, when the, there are two types of divorces that are there. Number one is what is known as a fault theory of divorce. Fault theory of divorce, what does that mean? That means that one of the parties to the marriage is guilty of a matrimonial wrong. And what are those wrongs? I'll come to it a little later. So this is a fault theory. And the second theory is, it's a divorce by mutual consent, where both the parties agree that they, they need to separate and they want to take a divorce by mutual consent. The original act of the Hindu Marriage Act of 1955 had only the fault theory and all the, all the grounds of divorce as we are called. It was only after the amendment made in the year 76, where major amendments were made to the Hindu Marriage Act and other religious provisions of the Hindu law, wherein a concept of a divorce by mutual consent, which is very popularly known as Section 13, capital B, was introduced in the Act. So from the year 1955 till the, uh, this the, um, mutual consent uh, clause was uh, uh, amended and brought into the Act, you could only file a divorce on some of the grounds which were there. So, so in, and later, when the amendment was brought about, the, the legislature thought it fit that there could be a situation where there could be no fault of any party, but it could be just a case where they don't get along with each other. Either they have issues of incompatibility or irreconcilable differences, and they both have decided that they want to part. Should the court or should the law not allow them to do so, rather than proving one is right and one is wrong, one is black and the other one is white. <clears throat> so a concept was introduced of divorce by mutual consent. Uh, first, let's go to what are the fault grounds of divorce. Now, when we go to the fault grounds of divorce, Section 13 deals with uh, those various grounds which are there. The first ground which is there, which is, and I'm, going to, I'm not going to read the section, I'm just going to tell you the gist of it, is adultery. If in a given marital situation, a relationship, if one of the spouses to the marriage commits the offense of adultery, then the other person has a right to go to the court of law and show that this marriage should be dissolved, a divorce should be granted, because the other spouse has indulged into adultery. Again, I'm giving you an example. <clears throat> if in a given situation, a wife finds out and is able to prove that her husband is having not only an affair, but please understand, in law, having an affair and committing an adultery are two different things. Having an affair without an adultery part of it will come under mental cruelty. But to prove adultery as a ground for divorce, the spouse who is the aggrieved spouse in this example of mine, who is the wife in this case that I'm taking, she will have to prove that there was sexual intercourse by her husband pending the marriage with some other woman 
who was obviously who was outside the valley. So she has to, she the, only then she'd be able to take the ground of adultery. One of the prerequisites of this is also that when you take the ground of adultery, in this case, the wife against the husband, she will have to name the correspondent, which is the woman with whom the husband had adulterous relationship, also a party to the proceeding. Only then a petition to that effect, to that effect will be entertained by the court. There are certain cases that came to me as a lawyer where the woman came to me and she said that my husband uh, is not having an affair or adulterous relationship with one person, but he goes to the prostitutes and the whores and the escorts that they have. And, um, and he's having with several, then what happens? Then there could be a provision where you could write that the respondents are several or respondents are not known and the details of it which is there and you have to satisfy the court which is there. Now, adultery is one aspect and I'm sure all of you as lawyers are aware of it that in 2018, it was also a, a, a wrong, which was a criminal wrong in section 497 of the IPC. Section 497 of the IPC has been recently struck down by the Supreme Court in the, in the judgment of Shiny versus Union of India, wherein the courts earlier to that had a provision of criminalizing the offense of adultery. Please understand that the Indian Penal Code is of 1860, so which is much, much before it's Macaulay's Indian Penal Code, much, much before the independence and within the British, pre British uh, era of uh, the rule that we had this uh, particular thing. Now, what was the provision in that? Now, it is, of course, a decriminalized, but for you all to understand it. And this was the provision that was struck down for various reasons. That I will not get into the details of it. If the husband finds out that the wife is having an adulterous relationship with a man during the period of their marriage and cohabitation, etc., the husband had a recourse in criminal law to file criminal complaint against the paramour or the adulterer or the, or the person with whom she had sex, <clears throat> frame him in the criminal charges, cannot make wife a party to those criminal proceedings, but of course she will be one of the persons because of whom the adultery has been committed, and he could have recourse in criminal law for that. There were certain provisions which were there which had to be undergone and the process had to be issued only if the court was satisfied, so on and so forth. Today, that is no longer a law. The courts have struck it down as being illegal, as being for various reasons which has been given in the judgment which is there. And as a result of which today, it only remains to be a, a matrimonial wrong, a civil wrong, where you have recourse in the matrimonial law, or you could have recourse under the, for the woman especially, she could have recourse under the Domestic Violence Act for emotional um, infidelity or for, uh, even for emotional infidelity, physical infidelity, adultery, etc. for the emotional violence and mental violence perpetrated on her. So adultery is one of the grounds for divorce, which is there. The second ground, which is the most important ground and most, of, most of commonly used ground in contested petition is cruelty. The concept of cruelty as understood in the 1955 Act was basically cruelty which included only physical cruelty. So if there was a situation where the wife was being bashed up by the husband, beaten up by the husband, then she could go on the ground of physical cruelty. Or there could be vice versa because it doesn't mean only that the wives are bashed up. Even sometimes the wives could also bash up their husbands and the husbands could go on the ground of physical cruelty. But later on, when the law developed and everybody uh, got, uh, sort of, you know, as the cases went on, it started off that there can be a marriage in which there is no physical violence, but there is immense mental violence, mental cruelty, anguish, grief, which is suffered by one of the spouses to the marriage. The excellent, uh, sort of, uh, I would say, a landmark case of that was Dastane versus Dastane, AI 1974, where Justice Wiley Chandrachu who was then the one who gave uh, the judgment in this, along with his other brother judges there, gave a very, very different nuance which are there. That there could be cruelty to an extent which could cause so much of grave, or so much and such grave mental agony, mental grief, and uh, pain and anguish to the person concerned, which cannot be 
uh, which cannot be laid down in terms of uh, in, uh, which cannot be laid down in terms of what could be considered to be uh, AI uh, to be considered to be what as I say um, uh, a physical violence where you can see a hurt. Suppose if if you are beaten up, then you have hurt on your hand. You can go and show that. Then there's a medical doctor, a medical certificate to that effect. But in a mental violence, it is called very insidious, a very silently which erodes the self worth which erodes the self-confidence and makes you feel worthless. That kind of an act of the spouse or the other person who is suffering that amounts to mental cruelty. In fact, if you read Dastanil's judgment, and I think you should read Dastanil's judgment, because even till today, I would consider that to be a classical case on what could be a mental cruelty. In that case, the mental cruelty was also due to the mental illness of the wife who had some kind of a mental illness. And this Dr. Dastani, who was the husband in this case, he finally got his divorce in the Supreme Court in the year 1975 by the judgment, which was since been given. The other judgment, which is also of cruelty, is Vishwanath Agarwal versus Sarla Agarwal, 2012, 7 SEC 288. Now, all these judgments, I mean, I can give you all these, but what is what have they held? They have held that if there is such kind of grave mental anguish, only then, that the, then the person can be given. But now this is the academic part of it. So I'll tell you now as a practitioner that how easy or how difficult it is to prove mental cruelty. In my experience as a lawyer, it is very difficult to prove mental cruelty because somehow, especially if you are uh, sort of uh, appearing for the husband, somehow the courts are not, are not, I'm talking with the trial court, higher courts, the, the, the uh, aspect changes a little bit and the, also the approach of the courts changes. But in trial courts, they go strictly by the rule of the law or the things which are there. And it is a difficult task for a lawyer to prove mental cruelty on the part of the husband. Which is. There could be a case of a husband where he says, my wife is nagging me. Who says, my wife is screaming, shouting, throwing things. So, and that, that would be a case where my wife is constantly doubting me. She's, she's put detectives up behind me or she's done all these things which are there because she feels whatever. Every day I cannot live with this thing which are there. Or she's creating false cases, she's doing all these things. The courts are saying that you have to prove mental cruelty only during the period that you live together. Now my practical difficulty as a lawyer is of a, which I can share with you is that even after leaving the house, suppose in a, in a given case and which I have dealt with with you, the wife was behaving in a manner which was absolutely amounting to mental cruelty having a fight and fighting with the landlord who was there, filing cases against the husband, filing cases against the in-laws uh, uh, for, for whatever various reasons which are there, seeking other things which are there, which was, which are all false cases, false allegations, wild allegations. But the courts are saying no. That all she has done after the filing of the case of divorce or after your separation which is there. You have to prove it only within that uh, specified period when you all were cohabiting together. So this is a difficulty that most lawyers face at the trial court level to be able to convince the court about the mental cruelty aspect of it. That's part number one. Number two, in fact, I would like to say that it was in the case of Samar Ghosh and Jaya Ghosh. And you may take down this citation, 2007 4 SCC. In this, the courts have held down that what are the various ground on which you will be able to get or what can constitute mental cruelty for the purposes of this particular uh, for the purposes of this particular aspect of mental cruelty they have given some 11 or 12 grounds which were there and they have then said that this could be considered as mental cruelty in such cases uh, which amounts to grave mental issues which are there a I'm just giving a few of them. Because I have to cover a lot of topics, I cannot get into the details of all. A, if there has been a long period of separation. B, there have been wild, uh, reckless allegations and false cases filed against each other. Thirdly, um, thirdly, and more importantly, that there have been cases where there are false cases filed not only against the husband, I'm just giving an example like a husband, but also against the in-laws and other, other people which are there. So these are the various cases which the courts have said. And the courts have said that either of this or some of these or all of these 
could constitute mental cruelty. Now, the Samar Ghosh's ju judgment has again been reiterated and which has been taken into consideration and the courts have also held the same thing. In K. Srinivas Rao versus Deepa, 2013, five Supreme Court cases, 226. This was Justice after Abalam and also the Bombay High Court judge, the lady judge, Justice Rajina Desai, who was later elevated to the Supreme Court. They have called this. They have reiterated the decision of, uh, of uh, Samar Ghosh and they have said that no uniform standard can be laid down. That this is what is mental cruelty. Because nowhere is the definition of mental cruelty found in the act itself. So where do you go for the definition? That is why if you go to black, which is a standard thing, the black law dictionary says mental cruelty, which is the ground for divorce, where one spouse's course of conduct, which is not involving actual violence, which is physical violence, creates so much of an anguish that it endangers the life, physical health, and mental health of the spouse. Now let's understand this definition of, uh, uh, which is the black law dictionary has given the de definition of cruelty. So the conduct of one which is not actual violence, so which means it's not necessarily physical violence, but it causes so much of pain and anguish that it endangers the life. If every day you are constantly badgered by one of your spouse or certain thing, you are going to lose your mental standard. That is endangering your mental health. health. Sometimes a behavior of the spouse could be so bad that it may lead to the physical ailments. Your blood pressure may shoot up. Your, your sugar levels may shoot up. So the behavior of the person, of the spouse, is nothing physical. Nobody is attacking you. But that day in and day out that you are suffering causes you physical health issues which are there. And also mental, mental health issues. You see so many cases which are there where people get into depression. Today, a lot of people are talking about depressions, coming out, about, coming out and speaking about it and taking a proper treatment that is required for that. But there are so many cases which are there where the spouses are locked in a relationship where they cannot get out. But living with the spouse is causing them mental depression, is causing them mental stress and causing them a lot of grief and anguish. So these are the aspects of mental cruelty which has to be there. But then, as I said, at a lower court level, these become a little difficult to be able to prove in terms of what is known as uh, the, the incidents or the, uh, or the actual instances which have taken place. Because you may quote the instances because then you have to justify how it has affected your mental health. <clears throat> there are a whole lot of questions which are there about cruelty. And today it's one of the most uh, sort of popular grounds that have been taken by the parties to it in the event which is not there. Now I I, I like to uh, I like to now give you some some of my views on this. Now the reason what happens is the why do you have to go in mental cruelty? Is there could be a case where a husband and a wife are not getting along. The wife also knows that I'm not getting along with my husband. The husband also knows they're not getting along for whatever reason. There's no violence in that. But the wife is not willing to give a divorce. Now, the reason why she's not willing to give a divorce is not because she loves him or she because she wants to live with him. But there could be some compulsions which she has. For example, some of them may have a social stigma. I don't want to be called a divorce wife. Some of them may be having insecurity. Maybe the age of the parties is such that today I am 50 years of age. Now I cannot get remarried. And as a result of which, um, I don't want to be known as a divorce because what do I do at the age of 50? I'm not going to go and get remarried again. So I don't want to divorce him. I'd rather be his wife, happy, unhappy, whatever the state. Or there could be certain cases where the wife is asking for the stars and the moon and asking for an unreasonable amount for a settlement in the event. He's not willing to do it. He's okay, then I'm not, I don't want to give you a divorce. In such cases, what a husband comes to you as a lawyer and he says, this is the situation. We both agree that there is no divorce, there is no future to our relationship. We have had no sexual relationship for several years. We've just been fighting with each other. We just don't, we don't see eye to eye on anything which is there. I want a divorce, but she's not willing to give for whatever reason which I Then what will you say? Okay, if she's not agreeing for a divorce, stay back, stay put wherever you are and do not go. No, that's not the case. Then you have to say that what is coming as extreme incompatibility
can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you are very much adverse. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So in such cases, then what happens? Then you as a lawyer will have to advise your client. That listen, this is a case of extreme incompatibility. Now, incompatibility or irretrievable breakdown of marriage or temperamental differences is not a ground which you have under Section 13 of the Hindu marriage. So what do you do? What recourse would you advise? Maybe if you feel that you can't live with her because that is affecting your mental, your, your physical, your emotional well-being, we can go under the mental cruelty and we will be able to prove to the court that this is what the situation is. So under such circumstances also, you have to resort to mental cruelty as a ground if the other spouse is not ready and willing to give a divorce, though she, she or he accepts that the marriage has broken down because there is no other option which is there. <clears throat> so this is cruelty. There are various judgments which are there. I could share those judgments um, a, a little later, but I thought what is important to understand is what is the concept. Today, the Supreme Court is increasingly uh, agreeing and appreciating the fact of uh, breakdown of marriage as one of the things. But please understand, unless there is a law to that effect, only Supreme Court under Article 142 of the Constitution has the right to dissolve the marriage on the on the grounds that they feel are appropriate, including the irretrievable breakdown of marriage. This is not used very commonly by the court because they, the, the Supreme Court, that is the apex court, because they don't want to lay down any precedence to that effect to be done. They use it in some of the cases which are there, but this right has been given to them under the constitution to deal with that. In fact, if you if you go to see the latest uh, uh, judgment which has been given by the Supreme Court in 2020, which is Munish Kapkar versus Nidhi Kapkar, um, which was uh, uh, January 2020, which was there. The courts have held, and this I will just read out to you because this is very important for us to understand what it is. Constitution of India, Article 142. Irretrievable break. I'm going to go read a little slowly so all of us can understand it better. Irretrievable breakdown of marriage. Dissolution of marriage. Counselors, psychologists opine that separation has been for 16 years and, and there's been a bitter battle between the two parties. There was no sign of any affection or bonding on either side. Parties had no history of pleasant time and only feelings of resentment arising from the court cases. There was no family support. Single judge appears to have brushed aside all allegations, etc. Mere willingness by one party to say that I'm willing will not suffice to keep the marriage growing. So where, now this is very important, where a marriage is found to be dead letter, the court has exercised its extraordinary powers under Article 142 of the Constitution of India to bring an end to it. Not only is continuity of this marriage fruitless, but it is causing further emotional trauma and disturbance to both the parties. End of this marriage would permit parties to go their own way in life after having spent two decades, that is nearly 20 years, battling each other, and there can always be hope, even after this age, for a better life, if not together, separately, and the divorce decree as well. Even in the, in the, in the well-known case of Naveen Kohli versus Neelu Kohli, the matter had come up. So what happened in Supreme Court is, I'm sure you're all lawyers, you know that, but some of them who are law students, I would like to explain this. That a matter travels from a, say, say from a family court, it goes to the high court, and from the high court, it goes to the Supreme Court. So that is the last court over which the, the relief has to be sent. Now that is when sometimes the courts now go in a very proactive manner and, and in, the, in, the, in the interest of the parties. Most of the Supreme Court judges now, if you go, they, they send matters for mediation. Because there is no substitute for settlement in all matrimonial matters. You may become tomorrow one of the topmost matrimonial lawyers, but your first fundamental duty is to ensure that the matters are settled amicably and the settled of, to the best possible interest of both the parties and if there are children, children themselves. So Supreme Court will, will first send the matter for mediation and reaches the matter. They are Supreme Court mediators and they try to do that. In some of my cases where I personally appear, 
the courts have also asked the parties and their attorneys and their counsels to come in the in the chambers of the judge. You must have seen that in the Bombay High Court also. Chambers of the judge with a view to settle the matter. The courts do not want to get and need the, and, and pass orders in a matter because not because they don't want to do that. Because a dissolution of a marriage is a, it's, it's not a win-win situation for either of the parties. There has to be something where there is a compromise because only that will have a long-term effect. So that is how the courts then decide what is to be done. In the Naveen Kohli, Nilu Kohli matter, when the matter came up to the Supreme Court, right after traveling all these stages and after nearly 10 years, 15 years, whatever the case may have been. Justice Dalvi Bhandari, who was then the, the judge who was dealing with the matter, in his judgment has opined that the Union of India, with the legislation, it is high time that you introduce the irretrievable breakdown of marriage as one of the grounds for divorce also. So that in such cases which have to come right up to Supreme Court for us to decide and dissolve the marriage, this could be one of the considerations which is there. So the Law Commission of India has made a, pro uh, has made a proposition to that effect to the, uh, regarding as one of, the, of one of the recommendations about introducing this, but it's still not become a law. So today you have to go to the grounds of mental cruelty, if you have to prove a case, even if it's a case of an extreme incompatibility and a complete breakdown of marriage. If I were to share you my case, which is there, there was a case which was filed in the year 1999. It went right up to the Supreme Court. In the lower court, the, I was for the husband, the court rejected the divorce petition, saying you have not made out the case of mental cruelty. High court said, that we cannot interfere because during that period that you live together, you've not been able to make out the case of mental cruelty. You, it may be grave incompatibility. We appreciate that there was nothing that was common between the spouses. They were like chalk and cheese. But we cannot do so because we are, we are, we are sort of, you know, on, on a personal level, we may understand that there is no future, but we cannot do that. So they, they also upheld the order of the lower court where the divorce was rejected. Yeah? Supreme Court also has. Now today, the man who has filed in 1999, the petition, is 2020. His divorce has not been granted. He has been living separately. There are certain maintenance orders, etc. The child custody issue, which was one of the issues at the lower court, where the child was 7 or 8 years of age at that point of time, is today an adult 21, 22 years of age. And the husband is not divorced. Now, there are people or lawyers who outside come and they ask me, I mean, how can it happen? If parties cannot live together, they don't live together. The wife has not filed for restitution of conjugal rights. Right? She's just opposing divorce and the court's not granting the divorce. But that is the reality. But if there was an irretrievable breakdown of marriage as one of the grounds which was there, then it would have strengthened the case of the husband in this case to be able to make a ground for divorce petition. So the reason I'm giving you all these different nuances is for you to understand what constitutes mental cruelty as we speak under the Hindu Marriage Act, but how the concept of mental cruelty has been expanded, defined, um, how do I say, uh, has been uh, clarified better by, by giving certain uh, insights by the judges who understand the practicalities of it, but who cannot really go beyond what the, what is the law as mentioned under the act. But they can use their discretionary powers as I just read out the case to you under 142 that they have done that. The other ground for divorce is desertion. Now, desertion as we understand is if one spouse has left the house of the other spouse and has not come back for a period of two years, then the person, say, say, let's say, say the husband, uh, the wife and the husband are staying together. The husband has left the house for, for a period of two years and he has not come back and they have not resumed cohabitation then the wife can, at the end of the two years, go and file a petition for restitution of one, uh, sorry, for a desertion, asking for divorce. Please see the difference between the two. Section 9 says that please ask the husband to come back to me because he, has, he or she has gone under without any constructive or uh, you know, justifiable reason. In this case, the ground is exactly the opposite, saying that she's, he's away for the last two years, he has not come back, so he has deserted me. And that is why I now want divorce. So these are the two differences which are there between the same concept of leaving. Now, desertion is understood under the uh, under the matrimonial law. Is desertion is not physically just going away. Okay, 
there are two aspects of desertion. Number one is animal desertion. Animal desertion means an intention of the spouse to go or to leave or to desert is one thing. And two is factum of separation, which is very clear, which means the fact that they are, that he has separated or gone. So these two points have to be proved by you as a, as a lawyer for the petitioner. That number one, that the, the spouse who has left the matrimonial home has, has, has no in, had an intention to desert me, had an intention to abandon all his or her matrimonial rights, duties, obligations. And number two, the fact that he's been away from me for two years is itself is a fact. But it looks very easy the way I'm saying it, but it is very difficult to prove in a court of law what is actually comes to desertion. Now, when we talk of desertion, we have to go into the various aspects of showing his intention to do that. The, the desertion clause also do not very vocal or do not very, uh, sort of how do I say, evident in the, in the word. It is an absolutely essential that you, the courts are going to ask you what are the efforts you ask you made to get him back. Your husband has gone and he has left. Are you just sitting like this? Okay, he'll come. Otherwise, if he doesn't come, I'll say no. You made efforts and he did not come back and that is what you have to do. There is also another concept in desertion which you have to understand. It's what is known as a constructive desertion. And this is a concept which is very important for you as lawyers to understand. There could be a situation where there is A and B, husband and wife. Okay, And please don't get me wrong, I'm just taking these examples as it comes to me. It's not that one is uh, talking about wife being the offender or husband being the offender. It's just an example. A and B has done that. A is the husband, B is the wife. The wife leaves the house and she starts staying separately, as I said. Then the husband comes and makes a plea, and she doesn't come back for two years. Then he goes to a court of law and makes a, a plea of desertion, saying that she has left me for the last two years and she has not come back and joined me. And then please grant me divorce on the grounds of desertion. When the petition is served upon the wife and she comes in, and if she is able to prove to the court that it was not that I left voluntarily. It's not that I was treated very well, I was looked after very well, but I just got bored of him and I started staying separately. But if she says that it is the husband who created conditions in the house, now what could be those conditions? Either there could be physical violence or there could be complete abandonment of the matrimonial relationship. Number three, it could be that the husband is an alcoholic, comes back and he drinks every night and creates a tamasha in the house and she cannot, uh, be, uh, she's not able to, um, you know, sort of go through it. Or he deprives her of the basic necessities of running the house, food, clothing, etc. So he creates a situation where it becomes difficult for her to do. And she leaves the house. In such a case, the courts have held, it is not the wife, though she has physically left the house, who is guilty of desertion, but it is the husband in this case who has created a situation which has, dis which has resulted in her leaving the house. So these are, the, these are what are the nuances of the desertion. There are other grounds which are there if somebody has converted from being a Hindu to some other religion, that is a ground of divorce. If somebody has any men mental disorder to that effect and that mental disorder that also entitles you to go for a divorce. As I said when I was discussing about the matrimonial fraud at the beginning of my lecture, was that this fact of a mental disorder was not disclosed to the wife or was not disclosed to the spouse prior to marriage. And then his consent was taken by deliberately concealing this fact of mental disorder. That gives him a ground of fraud and that once the fraud is detected, within one year he has to go to the court. There's also a ground for divorce that post the marriage, there's a mental disorder. The wife is, a, is, is schizophrenic or she has any other mental health issues which are there which are in that sense of incurable, then he has a ground for divorce. A wife has extra grounds for divorce in case there are any sexual, uh, sort of, how do I say, sexual and uh, vulgar or, uh, or, uh, or some kind of sexual uh, uh, imposition of certain sexual acts which are there in terms of sodomy, in terms of bestiality, etc. So these are the additional grounds which are given to divorce. So we have dealt mainly with what the grounds of divorce are. Now, in a case of a mutual consent petition, where both the parties are agreeable to the marriage, there are two preconditions which are essential. Number one, there has to be one year from the date of marriage. Number two, there has to be minimum separation of one year between the parties prior to their filing of the petition. 
Once the petition is filed, there is a minimum statutory mandatory waiting period of six months, which the parties have to wait. And then after the six months, it is the discretion of the court. And the court will once again reaffirm that the parties are still willing to go for a divorce and that they have no intentions of living together and they pass with them. And there are terms and conditions which are uh, captured in this. So these are the grounds of, the, this is how a divorce by mutual consent is done. So let's keep the divorce aside. Judicial separation also section 10 of the act talks about, where these are the identical grounds which are there in section 13. But there could be a case where the parties don't want to dissolve their marriage or they don't want to legally terminate their relationship with husband and wife, but they want to live separately, judicially separately with the sanction of the court for the various grounds which are there. That option is also given for the parties. If the courts are satisfied, they pass such necessary order. Now let's, the divorce is done. But after divorce, what are the ancillary reliefs? Ancillary reliefs are the reliefs which are the offshoots of divorce. So mainly there are two types of ancillary reliefs. One is the maintenance or the alimony. And the second part is if there are children from the marriage, what is the provision or what are the provisions regarding the custody care of the children? And that too, they're minor children. But now the law has gone a little beyond and they've also included certain things which are given to children to, uh, who are even, uh, or, or, or uh, offspring which are beyond the age of 18 or so. I'll come to that. Now maintenance, as we all know, is, is something which is needed for the support of the family. Now if you go and see the law of maintenance, which is there, one of the basic and one of the uh, classical uh, sort of features of the Hindu Marriage Act is the laws of maintenance and alimony are very gender neutral. What, are, what do I mean by gender neutral? Means even a husband can make a claim for alimony or maintenance in the proceedings under the Hindu Marriage Act. So under the various marriage acts that we have, and which are based on our person, personal laws, and our personal laws are based on our individual religion, it's only the Parsi Marriage and Divorce Act and the Hindu Marriage and Divorce Act, which to, uh, Hindu Marriage Act, which talks about uh, equality and gender neutrality as far as the uh, alimony and internal maintenance and, and maintenance is concerned. Now coming to this, there are two aspects to it. Number one, as far as the maintenance is concerned, the issue that arises is that you file a petition today for divorce. And typically in an Indian court, at a lower court, it takes around four to five years till the petition is decided either which way and the, and the rights of the other spouse are granted by the court. In the interim period, you have a right, or the wife has a right, most of the cases the wife has a right to approach the court and make an application for interim maintenance for herself and for the children as the case may be, seeking that I have more independent income. So there are two, three aspects that you have to understand. That, that there's an applicant's wife, she goes to a court of law and she says that I do not have independent income to support myself or I do not have independent sufficient income to support myself and, and hence the asking the court to direct the husband to pay for the expenses which, which could also uh, which is maintenance, food, clothing, etc. medicine and also the litigation expenses which are there. Once such an application is filed by the wife then it is for the husband to file his reply. The court says two things which are there. The court's expect the husband, and I'm again taking this by way of an example, the courts expect the husband to declare his income. If he's a salaried person, nine out of ten times there is nothing much that can be hidden from the court because there's a salary check or things which are there. Or if he is on a contractual basis, what are, what are the contract details which are there. And thirdly and more importantly, as you go into the higher bracket, what are the income tax returns that he files as income as disclosed by him to the authority and what are the various things that are included in that which includes his assets etc. At the interim stage the court only considers the income that the husband in this case has I've taken that he gets or disposable income in his hand from the various sources it could be. <clears throat> A person may have salary income, he may have rental income, and he may have other income which is like interest on his investments like, you know, uh, fixed deposits or mutual funds, etc. which is there. All this is combined as income 
and the courts then decide what is to be given to the wife. At the same time, they also ask the wife to disclose whatever she may have. So when you say, I do not have a sufficient income, what do you mean by sufficient? What is the income that you have? Then the courts make a comparative assessment of what is there and accordingly pass an order. The orders which are passed, now earlier the courts used to grant a very, I would use the word, a very pathetic or very insignificant amount of maintenance for, for wife and children which is there. When this law developed and it brought into it at the, and I went to the higher court, the courts laid down certain parameters which are there. And those parameters are it in the income of the husband, the income of the wife, the, the standard of living of the party. Because what could be from a lower strata that what could be their standard of living, what could be a standard of living of professionals who are there, and what could be a standard of living of the affluent business families which are there. All these standards separate. Thirdly, it could also take into consideration whether these wants are reasonable or not. Now, if you see, maintenance as such is not defined under the Hindu Act. It goes back to the Hindu Adoption Maintenance Act, Section 18 in which uh, maintenance is there. And section 23 of the Hindu Adoption Maintenance Act talks about what could be the criteria as far as the maintenance is concerned or the claimant has to get. For example, if you see, uh, it will have to say, section 23 of the Hindu Adoption Maintenance Act talks about what are the, what are the factors that the courts will determine. Number one, they will ascertain the position and the status of the parties. And we're talking about the financial position reasonable wants of the claimant, that is the applicant in this case. If the claimant is living separately, if she is justified, which is so under the Hindu Adoption Maintenance Act, because she has to prove to the court that she is staying separately. What is the value of the claimant, if at all? That is the person who is making an application, whether she has any income, any property, what is the value of that? Similarly, what is the value of the other person, that is the husband in this case? What is his property, which are there? And who are the number of people who are dependent on the person as far as the respondent is concerned? Now, these are the parameters that the courts use, the courts use in determining what is the quantum. Now, what we now find in most of these cases which are there, and I think sometimes it is a mischief of the lawyer, sometimes it's a mischief of the litigants themselves, or sometimes it's a harassment which has been used. And as the law stands today, it is what it is. That a woman in most of these cases can file proceedings under Section 24 of the Hindu Adoption Maintenance, uh, sorry, of the Hindu Marriage Act. She can file proceedings under 125 of the CRPC. And after the year 2005, also ask for maintenance under the Domestic Violence, Protection of Women from the Domestic Violence Act of 2005. So sometimes the courts are also faced with the situation where the wife has got an order from the DV court of an X amount and still she claims under the Hindu Marriage Act under Section 24 because she's saying I have to, go, I have to um, uh, sort of you know, defend myself in these proceedings and that is what I, I do not have money and the court should grant me that amount. So this is how these things come up. So the courts have to see all these factors which are there and then come to an amount which they could consider it to be a just and a fair amount. That is number one. Number two is also on the husband's side, many a times, section 106 of the evidence act says that the burden of proof is on the husband to prove what it is because this is a fact well within his knowledge. So whatever is a fact within my knowledge, I have to disclose to the court. Some of the husbands who come to the court do not come with clean hands, do not disclose the entire income. They are dishonest to the court and they, and they especially people who come from business background because there they can fudge the accounts or they can manipulate the accounts. So then the courts have said that you have a provision under CPC where you have the discovery, where you can have the income related documents to be sought for and in a court of law, the courts will direct and or even there are provisions where if he's an employer, if he's an employee and he doesn't disclose his entire, uh, you know, whether he's getting bonuses, whether he's getting any other perquisites which are there over and above the salary which he shows, then a witness summons can also be issued. So these are the ways and means to ascertain the income of a, of a spouse who is not who has not come with clean hands and who is dishonest or who has not done and these are the ways which are there the question that arises is and there are mixed questions uh, mixed views 
that can a working woman having having salary or having income of her own can she, can she still claim maintaining from her husband or is it only a non working woman who has no income of her own can she the courts have given, the courts have given different views on this and they have said even if a woman is working it will have to be a comparative assessment of the income that she has and the income that the husband has if there is a huge difference between their income the wife is earning say 10 rupees and the husband is earning 100 rupees the court will surely give her a little more to be able to have a reasonable lifestyle and the maintenance which is there similarly you see that um, uh, that even sometimes the claimant wife does not come out honest and clean then in that case the husband said out to pay so these are all things which are there at an interim stage what happens once the divorce is granted then the question of permanent alimony comes in the permanent alimony when it comes in the courts take into consideration the net worth of the husband at this point of time the courts take into consideration the assets of the husband which is there to do be able to ascertain the net worth of the husband at an interim stage it is not the number of assets he has but the income that he derives from the various sources that is calculated but in the permanent alimony phase the net worth the assets of the husband are considered by the court to be able to do that the courts also consider the age of the wife the courts also consider which is though not written in the law in the section but these are the different laws which are there the number of years or the tenure of the marriage number of years invested in the marriage the ability and the lack of ability the ability or the lack of ability of the wife to have independent income or to sustain herself and her compulsion in case she has children or some other medical health issues as a result of which she is unable to seek employment so these are the issues that the courts take into consideration earlier the laws of alimony were based are based again as i said you are the english law the english law matrimony i don't know how good we are with the time uh, let me just have a look should i should i why um, round it up now hello yes ma'am uh, uh, do i have five minutes to deal with this you can continue there is no time limit ma'am okay no no but i just want to see your convenience also so yes. so this is as far as the quantum of alimony uh, alimony is concerned alimony you have to understand because most of you lawyers will be appearing in court of law and you will be requiring to argue these matters which are there so you should be able to distinguish between what is an interim maintenance and what is the alimony post the divorce which is granted so uh, the uh, the as i said alimony is a concept because it is a uh, it's a respect given to the wife in, a, in most of the cases with regards to the matrimonial status because you have seen a wife in such cases which are there there have been several cases which have come in the high court in the supreme court which have laid down the laws as far as the alimony is concerned so you will have to first appreciate the fact that when such payments are made what are the payments made so some of the payments could be periodical payment that is a monthly payment which can be given in permanent alimony or sometimes a lump sum is given now once this is given does it mean till the end of the life you are stuck with that number the answer is no there is also an inbuilt provision wherein you can if there is a change of circumstances approach the court and ask the court for what a change of it because sometimes when they suppose when the order is passed out the wife did not, had no money at all and the court said granted 100 rupees maintenance to her but after 5 years she started earning and she is earning very well then the, the husband can go back and say that today she is earning why should i pay her 100 rupees also because she is earning well there is been a change of circumstance in that case the courts will say will take into consideration all the evidences and will pass for order of appropriation or it a monthly in maintenance comes to an end in the event of a remarriage because if she gets remarried and she starts life again then she gets, she need not be maintained by her husband unless there is a specific order which is to that effect which is captured in the court now very often the question that arises in alimony maintenance etc is what is the right of a wife to a matrimonial home and what are her rights of precedence so as i said that the definition the definition of maintenance is borrowed from the a hindu adoption maintenance act residence is one of is included in the maintenance of it now what is residence for a wife does it mean a ownership residence or does it mean a rented residence 
or does it mean granting of some amount which is there towards the rent etc which is there this differs from case to case and the courts will take all these factors into consideration so if the courts are going to grant a particular wife 100 rupees for her maintenance it is presumed that it includes her uh, her sustenance in, in terms of food clothing etc it includes her her residence also and it includes her other living expenses also it could also be a situation that a wife is living in the in laws house now this is a very strange indian concept of matrimonial home that you have to understand there is no concept of matrimonial home under the hindu marriage act or any of the laws are there it is only the law under the protection of women under the domestic violence act of 2005 where first time the word of a shared household was introduced in the legis- by the legislation and that shared household i'm not getting into the dvi but i'm just saying that is there so the concept of a matrimonial home is a concept which we have borrowed from the matrimonial clause act where under the act a husband was supposed to provide residence to the wife and that was or where they lived together as a couple that was the matrimonial home. in india we have a different situation in some of the cases In some of the cases, what happens is that when a girl gets married, she comes and she lives with the boy in her in-laws' house. So the house stands in the name of the in-laws. The husband is staying there, so she also stays there. Everything is hunky-dory till such time that that uh, that there is no issue between them. It doesn't matter in whose name the house is. It doesn't matter what it is. So in the event of a divorce, whether the wife files it or the husband files it, what would be her rights on that house is a question which is there. can she claim that to be a matrimonial home and if she can claim that to be the matrimonial home will the courts consider that to be her matrimonial according to her i got married i'm staying here this is my matrimonial but the courts have considered this aspect and they have said that it is the liability of the husband to maintain the wife including give her the right of her residence and it cannot be on the in law we all know the the famous case uh, decided by the supreme court by justice kachu of taruna batra in taruna batra's case she had gone to the court because her a mother in law had made a petition that the wife should not be allowed to stay in the house this matrimonial home is in my this home is in my name and i have bought it or I, my husband has bought it and nobody else has it so the courts have held that the husband and the wife in such a case where the house is owned by the in-laws are at best what is known as gratuitous licensee and since they are gratuitous licensee they will that means the gratuitous licensee the licensee will have to pay money they have no rights over that house and if the husband doesn't have a right the wife also does not have a right over that house so this is the judgment so there's another judgment which you you should also this is uh, taruna batra sp batra versus taruna batra only for those who want to know the citation is 2073 scc 169 equivalent air 2007 supreme court 1318 the other landmark judgment which you should know is bimla ben patel versus vatsala ben patel 2000 sorry bimla ben patel versus vatsala ben patel 2008 for scc 649 in this case also the courts considered the taruna batra judgment and they held that when it comes to the maintenance of the wife under the domestic violence act which is read with the hindu marriage act it is the personal obligation of the husband to maintain his wife and the property of the mother in law cannot be a subject matter in that case it was as far as the attachment was concerned so maintenance is a huge subject we i cannot cover it in all these things which are there but this is fact and i'll just take another 10 minutes or we maybe if you want we could speak um, uh, about custody later is that all right or do i continue yeah, ma'am continue you please continue okay okay sorry i've gone a little beyond my time but there uh, you know you know the act itself is so huge that we need to cover that the okay. child custody issue now when there are children who are below the age of 18 the issue comes up because both the parents want the child to be that they want to take care of the child the child can't be cut into two pieces so obviously the courts have to decide that where the child should be there now what are the enactments that we have under the existing laws in india number one is for the because we are talking about the hindu marriage act i'm coming to this hindu minority and guardianship act is there then you have the guardians and wards act 
Then under section, under Hindu Marriage Act, you have section 26, which deals with the custody of the children. And the Domestic Violence Act also has an interim arrangement as far as the custody is concerned. The Hindu Minority Guardianship Act basically deals with the custody and the guardianship of the child in case of the parties as in case. But what is important is the governing clause for this is the Guardians and Wards Act. The Guardians and Wards Act uh, is of 1890. So this is also a pre-independence legislation which has come. Where the course will appoint a guardian to the person and the property of the child. So there could be certain cases where a physical care of the child, which is his education, everything, uh, his living expenses, his education, his medical expenses, etc. have to be. So that care has to be taken, which is as far as the expenses are concerned. There is a care which has to be taken as to physically attending to the child is concerned. And thirdly, there could be some cases where some children have been gifted properties by the grandparents or whoever it is in the care of that property also. So when a custody is granted to a person under the Guardians and Wards Act, <clears throat> it is also the physical care of the child in that case and also the property of the child which is there till he attains the age of 18. Now how are the custody laws decided by the court? It's a huge subject. There are various case laws which are there. And today, as, as a lawyer practicing in Bombay, I deal with a lot of cases which are these cross-border issues. NRI marriages is also something which I want to talk about and the applicability of the Hindu marriage act. Now, if it's cross border issues, what happens is parties are Hindus. Since we're doing the Hindu marriage act, let me just deal with it. The parties are Hindus, they get married in India. After marriage, they move and they go for their job or for their other career prospects. They go to the US. They go to the US and they have a child. The child is born there. The mother, the father and the mother have some dispute. Now, in US and UK, they have what is known as the concept of joint legal custody. What is meant by joint legal custody is that the, both the parents are jointly custodians of the child, legal custodians of the child. But the physical stay of the child is divided in such a manner. For example, on a school working day, Monday to Friday, the child will be with the mother. And from Friday to Monday morning, the child will be with the father. So there are equal sharing of the rights, sharing of the parenting time, etc. So in a given situation, while this is there, if before the order is passed, and because the wife knows that there is going to be such an order, and she doesn't want the husband to have the child, she comes with the child to India. She's a, uh, she's a Hindu. She takes up a job or she takes up a residence. And she's, she makes a claim that I should be given the custody of the child. And until such time the custody is decided, an injunction restraining the husband from removing the child from my care and custody. In the meantime, the husband has moved this, let's say the English court, the US court, taken an order that the wife has, uh, has abducted the child and she's come back to India. And some orders are there. And these orders are there, you please come back, asking the wife to come back to India, uh, to UK, along with the child. In such circumstances, the child, the, the lady doesn't want to go back, though there is an order of the UK court, so she obtains an order over here. So which law prevails? Is it the UK court's order of custody which is important? Or is it the India court's thing which is important? So these are the lot of today the modern day problems of cross-border custody issues. It's a huge, huge subject of matrimonial law which you will have to understand. This is private international law. This is also custody laws of both the nations that you need to know. And then you also need to understand what are the parameters for that. So coming back to the Indian laws which are there. Under the Indian laws, it is not the rights of the parent that decides in whose custody the child should go, but it is the only guiding principle is the best interest and welfare of the child. So the courts will decide in a given situation what is in the best interest of the child, not what the parents want or what is my right. I'm a mother, I want it. But of course to decide that also they will have to evaluate over. It's very difficult for a judge to decide a custody matter. Please bear in mind. It's very easy for us, if you are for the husband or for the wife, just to argue a matter. But difficult for a judge. Because what happens is that the child becomes the ward of the court till such time the custody is decided. And the court assumes the role of a guardian. And so they have to give their judgment in such cases based on what they feel in a given set of circumstances, the best interest of the child. Now, does the best interest of the child only mean the financial aspect? Let's 
me give an example. A father and a mother are there. The mother has no means to look after the child in the sense of financial means. But she's physically taking care of the child, sending him to school, taking up his work, attending everything which is there. But she has no money. Can she be denied custody because she has no money to take care of the child? But what we say no. We will direct the father to do that. But you, mother, you please take care of the child. Attend to all his needs. Give him the emotional, physical, mental support that he needs in a process. Because please understand that the worst part of the divorce is what happens to the psyche and the mind of the children. And that is why me as a lawyer insist that the party should settle these matters amicably. Because I tell them, don't be selfish enough to look only what is good for you or what is in your immediate interest. Please see the aftermath or what effect you have on your child when he grows up. What is the emotional baggage of the past that he's going to carry when he grows up as a person? So coming back to this, these are the factors that possible. So who will be a better caregiver? The, the, the law used the, the law used the word private caregiver would be given the custody of the child, which they feel, and of course the visitation rights are given to the other in in, in most cases it is the father because the child is small, it is given to the mother, which is there. And then these are custody battles which go up and the fathers are not given. In fact, during the lockdown also, a lot of cases happen. Because there is a, um, a children's complex which most of the court time in Bombay also we have fun. Where, where, where to meet the child, then they said, okay, under court supervision. Last four months, the courts are shut because of the, the, the COVID issues which are there. The fathers, so many fathers who are not being able to get their children. So now the Supreme Court, in one of the matters which was there, said that during the lockdown, all fathers or all non-custodial parents who had access to the children and who are unable to physically go and meet, even within Bombay. Because what happens is the mother is staying in, she is staying in one place and the, the father is also staying in one place in Bombay. The society rules were that no outsiders are allowed at the house. So he cannot even go and see the child even if it's in the same city. So the courts had said that during this lockdown period, you should have more of video conferencing, you should have FaceTime, you should have such things, so that the contact between the non-custodial parent and the child is not uh, sort of you know broken, and there is some kind of thing to each other. So today we have to understand that Guardians and Wards Act is a basic document where the courts are given the power in custody battles to decide what is in the best interest of the child, taking into consideration various factors which are there and deciding what should be the rights of the non-custodial parent. Increasingly, a move is being brought about by the court to have joint parenting plans where equal rights are given for the, both the parents to, to have time with the child. Increasing the courts are considering joint legal custody also so that it is not like a possession that this is my property and not your property and you can only have it with it. All these are being done, these reforms, these legislations and these suggestions by the court in the, in the course of their judgment is only done to ensure that the child has a very balanced, healthy childhood and he doesn't get affected by the war between the couples, between their parents which is there and does not affect the welfare which is there. So today the custody laws are also undergoing a lot of changes and more so by judicial activism, more so by the judgment of the Supreme Court which take an extremely broad and a realistic view of the situation rather than sticking only to the letter of the law and at times even going beyond the spirit of the law for the betterment and the welfare of the children. So I think these are the few aspects that I have covered which I could do so and I'm extremely sorry for overshooting the time limit which was given to me but I hope I'm able to give you a quick journey of the Hindu Marriage Act uh, by my this discourse. Thank you. Uh, Advocate Savita Bhargi, are there any questions in chat box? Hello? Advocate Savita. I think there are no questions. Uh, sir, there are no questions in chat box. Please proceed further. Uh, Ma'am, we have received one question now. Uh -huh. uh, what happens when custodial parents doesn't comply with child access order? It's a very important question and a very relevant question. Most of the cases, most of the cases 
where the where the custodial parents if they don't comply with it there is a provision of contempt there is a provision of what you uh, the bombay amendment which which talks about you know striking of the defenses or the pleadings which are there but what really happens and which is more on a practical level is that this non compliance by some of the parents is done deliberately sometimes it is done by poisoning the child okay like always me patao yeah may i continue yeah yeah ma'am ma'am yeah, continue ha. sometimes sometimes the non the, the custodial parent the poison the mind of the child against the non custodial parent or the other person sometimes uh, it also happens that uh, there is a lot of deliberate non compliance of the order because you have a, a sort of you know there is revenge i always say in custody matters you must never have revenge and rage rage is anger if these two factors are kept that is best for the child both the parents have to act sensibly and they have to act in the best interest of the child but yes there are several cases which are flooded that more importantly fathers in fact the fathers have formed some of these such fathers have formed an association also in which they are now asking that there should be because what happens is i'll tell you typically if there is a maintenance order and if there is a uh, if there is a maintenance order and also if there is a access order if the maintenance is not paid by the husband okay that's if i example he is in arrears of 6 months of maintenance the courts will take very aggressive step they will attach his salary they will otherwise give him a threat of being arrested under cpc whatever your recovery proceedings are there under cpc but the same parameters are not used in case uh, it is the wife who does not comply with the custody order, access order because this is what the complaint of most of them is there today the courts are taking a strong view they have realized that unless the, the custodial parent is reprimanded and given some kind of thing for not giving access this will continue so the the so the uh, the the approach of the courts have changed now they are looking at it from a different point of view but at the end of it even today the reality is that there are some custodial parents who are not giving access to the custodial a non custodial parent causing not only a lot of pain and agony to the non custodial parent but a great harm to the child you got always remember any child you ask randomly whom do you want to be with and his only answer will be with both of them so if all lawyers keep this in mind they would be able to advise their clients in an appropriate manner and not only only to cater to the whims and fancies of the client ajun bhai prashna hai ka hi there is another question whether the prenuptial <coughs> agreements are vague in uh, india uh so i'll tell you for those of us who do not know what a prenuptial agreement is prenup is not is known as a prenuptial what is known as a prenuptial agreement is an agreement which is entered into intending parties of marriage a and b want to get married and before that they enter into an agreement before that they enter into an agreement today we are getting married we are in love we want to get married we want to be happy to ever after live happily ever after but what happens in one of the conditions where the person uh, the, the the marriage doesn't survive and they go for a divorce what are the terms and conditions you don't fight and you go by the terms today is popular in some of the countries in the uh, some of the states in the us in uk and in some other european countries also in india we don't have a law which is for a prenup agreement but let me tell you in urban metros like mumbai delhi etc there are quite a few families and especially wealthy families who are entering into what is known as a memorandum of understanding between the parties nobody has tested this in a court of law as of now it may be an effective thing but i don't think we are far away from the case where the prenup will not become um, a, a, a sort of you know acceptable proposition there there is another question ma'am there is another question is there any time period limitation to invoke or establish an emotional breakdown of marriage of a marriage so emotional breakdown of marriage can happen any time but as i said under the hindu law your emotional breakdown of marriage is 
a law a ground which is there only available under a mutual consent it is not a ground available under the fault theory of divorce which i just discussed but in a mutual consent the only time period is in one year from the date of marriage and one year from the date of separation so it could be any time between one year to say this hypothetically 50 years but minimum uh, it has to be one year from the date of marriage your separation which is due to the emotional breakup those two years could coincide around a couple of months you know just a, uh, a little two months after marriage also it can happen so it all depends on what it is the facts and circumstances of the case will have to be looked at first well uh, if a child's uh, father is died and uh, his mother is not sending the child in school or not properly up, uh, doing the upbringing can the other family member of the deceased husband can claim the custody of the ch child yes as i told you uh, they may not get the custody but if you are in a position to understand that the the husband is dead but his parents are there for example then his grandparents can go to the court and say that the child is not being treated well the mother is not sending the child to school not giving her uh, giving the child attention etc so we want to have the custody of the child and the courts if they consider that it is in the best interest of the child to give the grandparent the custody of the children they will surely do so but again as i said this all depends on how well you are able to establish that case just by making a statement it doesn't happen the person will have to prove it in this case the grandparents will have to prove it that how after the death of their son also whatever they have come to know about the child the child is not being treated well evidences witnesses etc as it happens in any other court so ma'am there is another questions that uh, um, if the mutual consent uh, petition is filed before the court but uh, during this uh, lockdown period the courts are not functioning can this ah. be treated as a compulsory cooling period as required under the law if you have filed the petition then it is a cooling period yeah. if you have not filed the petition then it can't be so it has to be 6 months from the date of the filing of the petition that you are divorced which is a cooling cooling period <laughs> it doesn't matter whether it uh, if you are fortunate it comes into the lockdown if you are uh, but if you have not filed it then that is not taken as a that can be at best taken as a separation period then there is another question uh, uh, when a mutual uh, petition for divorce is uh, filed decree is granted and uh, during that uh, petition the wife has not claimed any alimony ha huh. how she is she is uh, her health is not well and she is unable to maintain herself can she claim uh, the alimony and maintenance now yes she can because even in a mutual consent petition if she has given up her rights of alimony for whatever reason because she was working or she was doing well but over a period of time she has not remarried she does not have sufficient income of her own but she has this added problem of her health issues for which she requires then she can approach a court by filing a civil miscellaneous application in her divorce petition consent divorce saying that these are the changed circumstances but the courts will also consider that now if the husband has remarried if he has children from that new marriage if he has to support his wife also from that marriage whether what is the amount that has to be given because there is going to be one one husband and one income out of which there would be many claimants and one of them would be his ex wife who now needs it for the health reason but the courts will consider it uh, on a humanitarian ground and if considered appropriate to direct the husband to give a, a, some amount for her towards her health issue how uh, there is another question ma'am uh, how would the court decide a custody issue when both parents refuse to take custody of the disabled or autistic child in that case absolutely it's a very pathetic and a sad situation when it happens that none of the parents want to take the custody of a child who is a disabled or other child then the child then the juvenile justice act comes into play and then it could be kept into some kind of a, as they call the fonding home or the orphanage which is there and then the courts become the guardians or they appoint the guardians and it is taken care by them the first option is given to the parents or to the grandparents or the kids maybe but otherwise then the then the courts will take charge of the child become the guardian of the child and uh, and give the child to an a, a 
appropriate orphanage or the appropriate center for them. Now today you have Kara and all other centers which are there, which take care of such children who are either orphaned or who are abandoned. There are few, few more, more questions, ma'am. Uh, when the participants are demanding that the, uh, the, the citations we have, you have cited during the lecture, they want uh, it they, to be shared with them. Yeah, I will do that to you at the end of the lecture. Yes. Okay. I will send it to you, then you can do it. Yeah. Okay. We'll go to the next, next question, ma'am. Uh, can a husband uh, be charged with a rate of interest when? They unilaterally stopped paying maintenance during the lockdown period. And is there any judgment to that effect? So as of now, it has not been tested whether a rate of interest has to be given or not. There is also, if I were the lawyer for the husband, I would go to the courts and say that during the lockdown period, I have not received my income. I have not received my salary. My employer has not given me. He used to pay me 100 rupees. In the lockdown, he is only paying me 20 rupees. Now this 20 rupees is just about su uh, sufficient for me in, in that how can I comply with the court order. See this lockdown is a new concept for the courts also as much as it is for us. So we do not know what are the various problems. As the lockdown has caused a lot of uh, problem for the non-custodial parent to get visitation which I discussed in my custody uh, thing. The lockdown has also created lots of situation where some people who really are not getting income from there. Then what do they do? Ultimately, you can only give what you have. But if you don't have, then what do you do? But at the same time, the courts will have to see that you have to maintain your wife and child. What will they do? They can't be dying because of starvation or things. So that is where some kind of a balance will have to be attained by the court. Giving some kind of, okay, if it's 100 rupees that you're given, if you can't pay 100, at least start paying 50 rupees to the wife. Then she can make some arrangements and she can get some things done. And then we'll calculate the arrears after the lockdown is over and then you can get it through. It's a new concept, it's a new challenge and it's a new thing for everybody, all of us for that matter. Today otherwise you and me would not be having a virtual talk. You, I would have come to Shahpur for that. I mean, I'm giving you an example. Today all these things are happening because of the uh, uh, you know, pandemic that is brought about this lockdown. There is another question. Uh, if a petition for divorce is filed on the ground of cruelty and after that, uh, uh, before the commencement of trial, Two years separation of the parties is complete. In that case, can the petitioner amend the petition and add the ground of uh, separation? Desertion, sorry, desertion. No, so, so the question here is desertion has to be there from the date, two years from the date of the filing. But the pending the litigation, the desertion is not taken because you are in force already. You cannot take advantage of that. Because courts take time. Then you can't give the advantage to one of the persons to say, Are two years, I'm already separated. That is why, as I was telling you when I was discussing that, courts are now trying to introduce irretrievable breakdown of marriage. So if there is a separation beyond, say, five years, whatever, I don't know what the number of years is. The courts should consider this, that the marriage is broken down. If there's five years of separation, there is no possibility of them coming together. And that is the reason you should introduce that as a ground to be considered at the time of granting the divorce. So that is, again, this all is, it's a process that is happening gradually. We have developed a lot from 1955 to 2000 as far as the Hindu Marriage Act is concerned. So we'll have to consider this from a different perspective. But as of now, you can't call that desertion pending the litigation. It's only a separation. Uh, there is one another question, ma'am. Uh, what is the period of imprisonment for non-payment of areas of maintenance due to inability to pay such maintenance. If so it, all depends, it all depends on how the courts want to do So there is no such, this is not a charge of murder or something that there is something being specified. What is this arrest or which is made? The arrest is made only because you have not complied with the decision. So that is why it is kind of over for the recovery part of it. So it could be over 15 days, it could be even for more. It all depends on how it is. Sometimes the husbands come up and they pay the 50% of the arrears to avoid the arrest. Then at least the wife gets that. Ultimately, the the uh, the motive of the intention of the court is to give the wife, in, in most of the cases, who does not have maintenance uh, maintenance from the husband. And this is a little coercive way for him to pay the money. In many, in many cases, uh, the husband is often sent to 
uh, still behind bar for non payment of uh, uh, maintenance or yeah. payment yeah yeah that case can the uh, wife claim the amount for which the husband is uh, sent to sent behind bar again the the bhatta which he pays are you talking no, about no. that no no if then the what? husband is uh, sent to sent behind bar for non payment okay. maintenance correct huh. can the wife again claim that amount for the for for the non payment of which the husband has already uh, yes because he has to pay that amount yes. because he is not paid that amount and because she wanted to recover that that still remains as arrears we understand that it is still an arrear just because he's gone to the prison doesn't mean that the arrears have gone this is one of the ways to recover the arrears is there any uh, citation regarding this ma'am i'll give you i'll i'll send it to you yeah. thank you oh um, i think uh, we are enough with the questions i request our secretary i request our secretary advocate seva kumone to pay a vote of thanks uh good afternoon ma'am good afternoon everybody uh, firstly i would like to thank you my our uh, president advocate dabish walgade sir for giving me a uh, uh, great uh, network issue to uh, deliver a lot of thanks uh, and uh, points uh, uh, that was very comprehensive precise and uh, it will be very uh, helpful for our uh, advocate friends for their day to day practice and uh, the judgment uh, you have referred in your lecture uh, that uh, manish kapkar and navin kohli i assure you ma'am that uh, we will definitely will definitely collect copy of judgment and tips and uh, uh, bar association i would like to thank you for giving us spare uh, spare valuable time during the period of this lockdown and uh, it is a my, my humble appeal to all my advocate friends that that uh, endeavor should be made on the part of every advocate that uh, the wedlock hello can you hello yes yes you continue uh, uh being a uh, secretary of sapur court bar bar association i would like to thank you madam uh, that giving us uh, valuable time uh, during the period of this lockdown and once again i am uh, thanking you and uh, yes yes <laughs> that the lecture today lecture is now over and will inform you on zoom app thank you i think there is some network issue no problem thank you ma'am and uh, we are ending this meet meeting now the uh, participants who have missed any part they can view this uh, meeting on uh, youtube or youtube channel Shahpur Court Bar Association. Thank you. Thank you. There is a network issue.